Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 21st installment of the Galen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. My name is Dwayne Mancini. I'm the CEO and managing partner of Project MedTech. Today, we'll be hearing from Mike Cremines from Highland for a discussion on framework for risk management. Um, some of the key takeaways today are the definition of enterprise risk management, the unique risk to connected devices, what you should be thinking about as it relates to risk, and what do you need to know about cyber insurance. But first, a few housekeeping items. Um, Galen Data is the cloud for medical device makers. The Galen Cloud provides a configurable platform for device to cloud connectivity that is compliant through FDA, HIPAA, and CE Mark standards. Built on 40 plus years of collective experience developing compliance systems in the medical device industry, the company's goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all at a fraction of the cost while shaving months off the development timeline. With that being said, I'd, I'd like to welcome our guest, Mike Cremines. Mike is the life science industry practice leader at Highland and 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 also just overall a, a, a good friend. And so, Mike, I, I had to wear all my Ohio gear today. I know, um, I, I messed up. I should have had my picture of the walleye behind me. <laughs> being being right now, Mike and I are probably sitting no more than 30 minutes apart from each other. Right. Um, <laughs> so anyways, Mike, with that being said, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Dwayne, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate the folks um, at Project MedTech, but certainly at Galen Data for allowing me to, to talk uh, today. So thanks to everyone for this opportunity. All right, so let's dig into it. Uh, you're very busy people. What do we got on our minds today? All right, so, and you know, the first thing that I usually like to talk about is, well, what are we gonna walk away from as far as this session is concerned? Well, there's a couple of things. Well, why should I care about this? I mean, uh, if you're a CEO, um, manager, board member, investor, you got a lot going on. There's only 25 hours in a day. What is it about this enterprise risk management thing that really is important and why should I even care about it? We're also gonna do a little bit of defining of what enterprise risk management is. You know, folks, honestly, if I think about the word risk management, every single person on this webcast today has a different version and a different definition of risk management. You may be a supply chain risk management person. You may be a workforce comp risk management person. What I want to do is get very high in the clouds and talk at an enterprise level and define what I believe um, is an important concept in enterprise risk management. Also, as a CEO or a manager, what should I be thinking about um, today when it comes to risk, risk management? We're also going to talk a lot about the stakeholders. There are several. Some of the stakeholders that I'm going to mention, perhaps you didn't, uh, they didn't come to the top of your mind. Employees are stakeholders, customers are stakeholders. There's all kinds of stakeholders involved here. We're gonna kind of go through those and define them a little bit. How can I manage the process? Again, as I said before, 25 hours in a day, I've got a lot on my plate. How do I stay on top of this stuff? And then specifically, um, what are the unique risks to connected devices. I've had the great fortune for close to the last 30 years of being in uh, this uh, space where my customers are FDA regulated customers except for food, tobacco, and cosmetics. Um, that means medical devices, medical technology, um, and uh, I've been around it for quite a number of years, but there's also some unique um, uh, risks that are associated to connected devices. Let's talk about those a little bit. And then what are the outcomes? Mike, if I'm gonna spend time on this, how are you gonna make it worth my time? Why should it be worth my time? And what are we gonna get out of this? Okay, so, you know, when I first meet people, they always say, okay, Mike, what do you do? Well, I think I'm good at a couple of things. Number one, I think I'm good at solving problems. You know, folks, I've been very fortunate. As you can see, I have more salt than pepper in my beard. I'm a seasoned professional, I'm not the old guy. So what that means is, is that I've been able to accumulate a Rolodex or a, a fairly robust um, 
group of contacts of people that are able to help my customers and my prospects and my friends solve problems. So I believe that I'm in a position where I can try to figure out what's wrong and how can I help you. The other thing that I believe I'm pretty good at is risk identification. We're going to talk about some of those things. What are the ship sinkers? What are the things that are going to prevent you from actually achieving your goal, whatever that is? I also try to keep people out of trouble. If it hits the fan, now what? What's our contingency plan? How do we react quickly? How do we get ourselves in a position where we can get ourselves out of, out of trouble? And I also happen to be in the insurance business. Well, there's another thing, folks. I'm also a mind reader, okay? I get it. You know, when, when people think about someone that's in the insurance business, I mean, it used to be when I told someone what I did, the first thing they did was think about, oh, I'm missing a root canal followed up by a colonoscopy. I'm not going to talk about this stuff. Well, I'm going to change your thought process on this. This is not about insurance. Before we get there, there's three truths in my business. We have our own language. We like to confuse, and we're pretty good at it. There's also three beliefs about the insurance business. Uh, all you guys do is deny claims. You're always trying to sell me something. And the TV commercials you see represent the industry. Let me promise you folks, the TV commercials that you see for automobile and homeowners insurance on TV, they do not represent the commercial or the uh, insurance business. This is not about insurance though. Just wanted to admit that I'm in, I, I also do some insurance work, but let's talk about an operational guidance for your business. I want you to think about this. Ask yourself some basic questions. What could go wrong? Who would be upset at you? What would they be upset about? And then what are the potential financial damages to the company? What are the ship sinkers? And then I didn't put it on the screen, but okay, once we figure all these out, things out, well, what are we gonna do about it? Why should I care? We talked about this at the top of the webcast. Well, as many of you know, there are in fact legal requirements and contracts that are imposing liability on you. They're imposing uh, different terms and conditions that require you to focus in this um, particular area of risk management. Your investors are um, particularly interested in this. You've got a board that you have to answer to. Folks, nobody needs to tell you that there are bad actors in this world. I'm gonna talk about this later. I will submit to all of you CEOs out there that I believe a robust enterprise risk management system will actually result in higher valuations. I don't have hard empirical evidence, but let's talk about it. I'm gonna tell you why I feel that way. I think managing human capital uh, including your employee safety. This is a really important thing. Um, you are responsible for the safety of your employees. And let's face it, you've got multiple regulatory considerations, including data and privacy. I mean, think about just the USA, well, actually you have individual state data privacy laws, then you have United States laws, then you have GDPR. There's so many different regulatory considerations. You've got product risk. Your products could cause bodily injury or property damage. There may be some other financial damage. Business continuity is important. If in fact you do have a disaster, something that creates a problem where you can no longer produce your product, you can't get into your company's information systems, you can't service your customers, what is your plan to get back up and running and get operational again? Third-party liabilities, we talked at the top of the screen, as you can see, the legal requirements and contracts. Many of you are faced also, there are social, economic, and political changes in our world that actually do create some risk for you. Just wanna make you aware of it. All right, so let's get clinical for a second. What is risk management, okay? As I said before, there are many different definitions of risk management. I remember talking to John Spear over at Greenlight Guru. Well, John, what's your definition of risk management? I have my definition, but let's just get down to the clinical definition. Identifying, assessing, controlling financial, legal, strategic, and security risks 
to an organization's capital and earnings. See how high we are in the clouds? What are the risks? It comes from a variety of sources, risk does, including financial uncertainty, legal liability, strategic management errors, accidents, and natural disasters. So that's the clinical definition. So I want to give a shout out to uh, a friend of mine, uh, John Kellefick, he's the Astro Orion Group. He's over in Pittsburgh. Um, John is um, uh, very much involved in helping people uh, improve healthcare through artificial intelligence. I would say he is um, uh, a subject matter expert on an artificial intelligence. The next two slides are really things that I've gotten permission from him to use because I think he's been able to express what I've always tried to say about um, delivering this uh, customer value as far as uh, putting in risk management system in place. I mean, folks, if you think about it, a quality management system is really minimizing it risk for the end user. So let's talk about some of these things. On the left, you've got events. And then underneath on the screen, you have um, probable events and hazards. You got bad actors, refusal, refusal of a, a customer to pay, loss of key employees, you release protected health information. Your product or system has a defect. Well, all of those events cause hazards for the enterprise. They could affect different parts of your enterprise. Okay, now who are the stakeholders? Well, I talked um, at the very beginning, who are the stakeholders? Well, it's the user, um, it's the customer, the clinical champion, the business partners, the, ven the vendors, the employees. These are all stakeholders that are affected by um, uh, putting in or trying to manage risks uh, in a company. John also talks about the proposed house of quality. So what does that mean? Let's start at the bottom. So there's, there's, there's four different areas. Having a great quality manual and an enterprise management policy is critical. It helps build a foundation. A product or service development process and phases, phases help build a foundation. Information security and privacy controls and management, and then a business operational risk management program. All of these things actually allow you to put a great foundation in place to build this quote unquote house of quality. You got management controls, you've got an enterprise risk management system, business processes, and in, in uh, uh, John's view, and I agree with him 100%, um, you build this quote unquote house of quality. Okay. All right, Mike, so we get the house of quality thing. I think we're just about there. All right, so how do I manage this? I don't have a lot of time. If I'm a CEO, I, I don't have the ability to spend a lot of time on this. All right, well, what I would suggest is, is that you actually should be in a position to consider what I'm calling a risk management committee. Folks, you can actually depend on the people within your organization to help you um, uh, pull this off. Now, everybody thinks differently. Everyone has a unique perspective on risk. If you're a CFO on this call, you think about risk in a certain way. If you're an engineer, you think about risk in a different way. If, you, if you're a salesperson, if you're a marketing person, you're um, a QMS, CEO, you all think about risk in a different way. By looking at it as a risk management committee, this creates a seamless collaboration. I put stole this, it allows you to simplify, democratize, and inform team members of your team. Um, Dwayne um, and I know Mina Fahim, who is the CEO of MediView, happens to be a Cleveland company. I love his speaking style. He's just such a smart guy. He's built some amazing teams. I would encourage you to go into Project MedTech's vault and listen to Mina's um, talk. Uh, but he is the one who came up with this seamless collaboration. So I thought I would uh, give a shout out and give him credit for those words. Okay, so we're gonna get this, this committee together. So what are the goals? All right, so enterprise risks should be transparent in their meaning easy to understand across all levels. Take a look at the next piece here. We have an open dialogue. 
folks, this is a key point. I believe that communication risk is one of the biggest risks that people have, internal communication. I put disc anyone up here. I, I'm a student of personality profiles. DISC happens to be one of those personality profiles. Folks, remember I talked before on a previous screen, everybody thinks differently. I mean, think about the different personality profiles. If you've got an engineer in the room and a salesperson in the room, the engineer looks at that salesperson and says, how in the heck do you even tie your shoes in the morning, right? The salesperson looks at the engineer and says, dude, can't we just go with it? I mean, come on, let's just move on. So you've got, you've got different ways of thinking. You have different approaches that people have and di different ways of trying to solve problems within a company. What I'll tell you is, is that by putting this committee together, everyone gets on the same page. You define things in, the, in, a, in a way that everyone has a common understanding of exactly the risk and what it is that you're talking about. And I believe that an enterprise risk management program is heavily integrated, should be heavily integrated into the strategic planning process. Um, and it's going to make it uh, overall uh, much more effective. Okay? So those are the goals of this committee. Dwayne, by any chance, any other questions come up? I don't see anything in the chat, but. Um, Not yet. Okay, you still have my permission. Okay. Okay. Okay, Mike, so we've gone through all of this. We're going to put a risk management committee in place, but tell me how this is going to be worth my time. What are the outcomes? Well, we already talked about the house of quality. Use it to your advantage. And I'm going to talk about a couple of ways that you can actually use that house of quality to your advantage. Investor stakeholders, your clients or prospects are going to have, uh, I think, a better outcome. Um, your internal communication is going to improve. Trust, transparency, and team. There we go. I stole this also from Mina again. Um, I think contract negotiations are going to be much more effective because you've established a benchmark at the beginning of the company as to what's acceptable to you. What, what kinds of things are you going to agree to within a contract? You don't have to continue to look at these contracts and have a committee um, every single time you sign a contract, you know, if, if you started the process and you've got a process in place to um, uh, understand what you are going to agree to and, and what some of the walkaways are in some contracts or agreements, it's already going to be established. It's going to be more effective. It's going to save you time. Okay, well, so let's get back to the insurance piece just a little bit. You know, think about it for a second. Folks, some of you have insurance brokers that throw applications at you. It's on your desk. You don't want to complete it. It's a pain in the neck. So what do you do? You complete the application and you throw it in. The broker goes out and gets you a bunch of quotes. You get the cheapest one. That's the one I want to go with. Well, think about it. If you've got a house of quality in place, if you have an enterprise risk management system in place, if you coordinated all those efforts, that information should be part of your insurance submission. And I will tell you right now, you will get a better outcome. It will cover the things that you want. You'll have a much more robust um, insurance program with better terms and conditions and for a lower price. And then I say on the screen here, you can also be ready if you have to change insurance carriers. All right, so let's talk about connected devices. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all these up on the screen. And let's think about this for a second, okay? I got some samples here of of uh, the uh, words that are in contracts. And some of you who review contracts like I do every single day, you're going to appreciate this. Okay, Mike, so why are you putting this up? All right, so think about what it says in a lot of these contracts. You shall implement reasonable security measures to prevent unauthorized access. You shall at all times limit access to data and confidential information. Each party will comply with the terms and conditions of confidentiality as far as intellectual property is concerned. You will apply, you will um, comply with applicable laws, and then you get into warranties. So what I do is I take the contracts that you're signing, you're making these promises. So if you are in a position where you are making the promise that you will provide a secure network, 
well, I'm the disaster guy. What happens if the allegation is, is that you don't provide a secure network? Contract says this, insurance policy says this. What I do is I lay them on top of each other and I try to put you in a position where you can know that your insurance policies are actually going to be there to defend you. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but it's going to cost you money in order to defend some type of an allegation that you did fail on some of the representations and warranties that you made in your contract. These are a couple of the things that, that are really um, focused on connected devices. You know, your product fails to perform. Well, when did it fail? Was it in the um, uh, was it in the device that that picks up information? Did the error occur during the in, during uh, sending the information through the, the uh, cloud? Did the information go to the clinician in in an incorrect way? What really caused the problem? Intellectual property is a big deal. It's in every single contract. Um, we already talked about network and security liability. You are promising in many of your contracts that you will provide a secure server. You'll provide a secure something. Well, what happens if you somehow have a breach and you become legally obligated? Um, incident response uh, costs are important. Legal, forensics, you know, potential for distortion. Hold on, let me go back to this. System damage, business interruption, reputational harm, bodily injury. These are a lot of things that are unique to connected devices. Okay. The next two slides, and by the way, you'll have access to this presentation. The, the next two slides are going to be a cheat sheet. Probably the next one is going to be something that you'll want to print out. Look, folks, everyone continues to talk about cyber, cyber, cyber. We have cyber fatigue. But I'll tell you something, 80% of the people out there have no idea what cyber is. So what's confusing about it? Everything, okay? The coverage is referred to by various names. I've got GigaSafe, I've got MegaSafe, I've got Cyber Secure, all these names. What do they mean? I have no idea. you got to look at the policy to figure out what is actually covered. So just because some, some, um, uh, someone defines or names their policy, GigaSure, uh, it doesn't mean anything. You gotta really peek under the tent to see what's in there. The nature of the coverage is different from insurer to insurer. The menu-driven nature of these policies create special problems. What I mean by that is sometimes in a contract, what they're gonna do is bifurcate as you heard me talk in the explanation or the description of the one contract. Okay, we've got a cyber section, we've got an IP section, we have a security section, we have a, probably there's a BAA agreement, all those kinds of things. Well, how do you take all those representations and this menu-driven policy and again, lay them on top of each other to determine whether or not you actually have something that is complying with the contract that you're signing? Look, folks, it's not going to surprise you, especially if you've purchased cyber in the, in the recent past. Um, the exposure is changing. The terms and conditions are getting much more restrictive. The premiums are going up, and it's definitely rap rapidly evolving. Um, what I'll also tell you is, is, and again, for those of you who are in the contract, you'll see all these different words. Remember the three truths in the insurance business? We have our own language. We like to confuse. We're really good at it. So. What is professional liability? What is media liability? What is cyber? What is what are fines? What is first party? What is business interruption? So all so a lot of these actually do overlap. So it's it's important to make sure that you understand that um, you've got to go through all the policies, see what's in there, and then determine if you have any gaps. We've already talked about um, the policy form. If you have controls, if you've got a process, I'm repeating myself, right? Hopefully you remember or you'll appreciate all of this. If you've got some type of controls in place, if your policy gets you renewed, you're gonna be in a better place to find another uh, policy. Okay, simple, simple, simple. What is cyber? Three coverage buckets. First party, 
breach response, extortion, business interruption. What is business interruption? Your system goes down, you are no longer able to perform your business. So something happened. There was water damage to your computer system. Somehow your network goes down. There's, there's inability for you to actually perform your product or service. Well, that's an interruption to the business. So those are first party costs. Third party, network and security liability, regulatory fines that we have to continue to deal with. Every state has their own breach laws. I think probably a lot of the people on the call today realize that. By the way, you do have to follow the breach laws in each of the states where the claimant resides. And then you've got PCI penalties for those of you who use uh, credit cards um, to uh, get paid for your products and services. The media liability is a third party risk. Third bucket, e-crime, social engineering fraud. Um, someone is a bad actor, comes in, um, is a uh, saying that they're the CEO, you need to send me all the payroll records, you send them to them, it's not actually the CEO. Communications fraud, and then of course, funds transfer fraud, okay? What is cyber? There it is, folks. Three buckets, first party, third party, e -crime. Okay, I've got all these things going on. I've done some risk assessments, folks, where I sat in a room with probably seven managers of a company we had a whiteboard that was as big as the wall we filled it with all the risks i think we came up with 125 different risks that's not manageable um, so what are some of the top risks what are some of the things that, that i suggest that you focus on today contractual liability is not going to go away contractual liability is something if you think about it for those of you that that got your technology through a university what have you got a tech transfer agreement there's a contract. You get funding. There is a term sheet. It's a contract. You have a lease. There's a contract. You have customers. All kinds of contractual liability. It's something that is never going to go away. You need to focus on it. You have to have, to have a process for managing it. The blocking and tackling piece is, is essentially, you know, as a CEO, you're thinking at a very, very high level. What I would say is, is you've got to have people who can execute looking at the contracts or agreements, um, understanding what they mean, how do they affect uh, the business. So that's what I mean by blocking and tackling. Human capital is something to really focus on. This is one of those duh things, right? You know, Mike, I need to find people. How do I find people? Um, what kind of qualifications should they have? How much am I supposed to pay for them? What's the market? The other thing that many people don't think about is what, what about timing? You may need you're using perhaps a third party regulatory consultant today, but when are you, when are you supposed to bring in uh, someone as a W-2 employee as a regulatory consultant? So timing is important as far as human capital is concerned. Folks, let me make the representation very clear. Um, people come to me just because I've been in the space for a very long time. Hey, here's my deck. Do you know anybody who might want to invest? Look, I'll, I'll take those emails and calls all day. Um, I am not a professional fundraiser. I have no specific um, uh, license to be a fundraiser. However, in, this, in the time that I've been in the business, I happen to know where some potential fundraising options might be. Uh, it could be a person of means, a family office, some type of angel group, um, a lot of venture capital, and on and on and on benchmark and get the facts the the one of the biggest questions i get is and it gets back to um insurance as well is well directors and officers like what limit should i buy well in this particular case there are actually documents out there that can give you some benchmarks you don't have to wing it anymore um the other thing that i want to point out is to especially the c-level people if, if I were you, I would look very carefully at your articles of incorporation that talk about indemnification. What is it that the company is saying to you and what are they committing to you as far as indemnifying you for the decisions that you're making as a manager of this company? And is there a gap? 
taking a look at the articles of incorporation, looking at the gap, are there personal liability concerns? I mean, you may have an employment agreement. In that employment agreement, are there any type of um, potential personal liabilities that are involved? So this turns into not just a business discussion, it turns into a personal liability discussion. Folks, don't accept poor service or indifference. I think it's easy for everyone to believe that, but let me tell you, there's always people out there that want your business. If you're not getting a response from some of your service providers, how about you fire them? So what happens is you grow. Objects appear, <laughs> objects are closer than they appear. We've all seen it on our rearview mirrors, right? These things are gonna happen very, very quickly. You need to start preparing, anticipating, and educating yourself on what it feels like to launch a product, what it feels like to launch in the EU, to have clinical trials in Australia. What are the local laws? Why does someone say I need 10 million and another person says I need 20 million? Um, what, what, what is it that I have to do to comply with local competent authorities? So anticipate where you're headed, take your strategic plan, and then lay it on top of the risk management plan. And I think you'll be, you'll, you'll be in a much better position. You'll at least you'll be educated on how risk is going to change. Risk also becomes aggregated. Think about this, folks. You're signing contracts, but if you've got a, um, a mature product, how many contracts have you signed? Well, I've signed with three GPOs, six hospitals, my contract manufacturer, my distributor. Well, you've committed to all of those that you have a million dollars worth of liability insurance. Well, unfortunately, I think in this particular case, your risk becomes aggregated. I'm not so sure that you have enough. So there has to be a discussion about that because the risk does become aggregated. Contracts are more complicated. For those of you who have dealt with GPOs, God bless you if you're a GPO and on this call. Group purchasing organizations have 85 page contracts. The insurance is three pages. Um, they're gonna become very, very complicated. Again, the three truths, you're gonna find them in there. Product support is a big deal as you grow. How are you gonna manage keeping your customers happy? We've already talked about the human capital thing. It does become much more uh, complex. I'm a local competent authority. Um, I place clinical trials all over the world, and um, we're able to help our clients with uh, what those local regulations look like, what the local competent authorities look like, what are some of the laws that you need to comply with. I'm working with a lot of attorneys or with representatives in those various countries to make sure that my customers understand what their legal obligations are. As you grow, there's also many options to finance and manage risk, meaning you can take on higher deductibles. If you get really big, maybe you can self-insure. There's captive. There's all kinds of different ways to actually finance the risk that you have. Also, if you think about the life cycle, from seed to series A, B, C, and then some type of an exit or a, a an IPO, a, a sale, um, the, the risks are definitely going to change at each individual funding uh, milestone. I'll just call them that. And we already talked about personal liability. Board of director changes. For those of you who have gone through a B and C round, guess what? You've had a board change. No surprise there. If you have a robust enterprise risk management system in place, you know, you can always deal with whatever new personalities are presented to you with the new board. You've already got those processes and procedures set in place. So exit consideration. Folks, if you're a company and your exit is to sell, I'm just going to pick out, you're, you're going to sell the striker. Okay. All right. And have you looked at what the striker um, agreement looks like? No. Do you know what their checklist looks like? No. So what I'm telling you is, is if you can anticipate what those questions are going to be, what their due diligence process looks like, what their questionnaire looks like, what are they going to care about? You can talk to your friends. They're going to know because they've probably been through it. I will tell you that if you take some of these negoti negotiations off the table and you have yourself in a position where you can answer all of their questions to the best of your ability, you know, when uh, you get ready to sell, 
my belief is that you will have stronger negotiating position and you will have higher valuation. So that's where I'm at. Um, not sure how we did on time, Dwayne. Um, but uh, so that's uh, that's what I got today. Yeah, no, I did great on time. So we still have about 20 minutes left um, for for questions as well for Mike. Um, so if you want to drop some of them in the chat to the right here, there's a spot for questions. Feel free to drop them in there and we'll get them asked. Um, but in the meantime, Mike, I, I have a handful of questions as well. Um, sure. So uh, you touched on cybersecurity um, and this is a big concern for certain companies who are thinking about connecting to the cloud or right. thinking about you know a connected medical device in 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 any sense and i think you know even project medtech had some of these discussions with you as well on on some on certain items so i'm just curious on um you know what does that process look like from from going through that to way hey is it worth it to have you know, I mean, everyone knows, right, that the, the key is data. Um, right. You know, if you can collect a ton of data, there's a lot of value in that, but at what risk does that come? And and so there's there's ways to do this um, safely sure. by regulations, that kind of thing, but but just from the risk side, you know, what does that kind of process look like and and, sure. and how do you go about outweighing, you know, weighing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Dwayne, I don't think it's going to surprise you that it's certainly going to start with uh, the contract. So let's let's just talk about AWS for a second. Um, name name another um, big cloud provider besides uh, Amazon. Google. Google, uh, Microsoft. All these folks have got their their own um, um, cloud based storage. And then we have Galen Data. We have all kinds of people that are providing a solution in the, in the cloud. First thing you have to do is you have to look at the contract. I'm going to push Galen off to the side because I'm only going to talk about Amazon and Google right now. If you peek under the tent in that particular agreement, um, and first of all, if AWS goes down, we are all in really, really big trouble, right? If, if Google goes down, I mean, it's it's not going to be a good day. Um, so in that particular case, I think you have to look at the contract or agreement. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm pretty sure what the agreement is, says is we will endeavor to keep our system up. We'll do our best. We're going to try like heck. We're going to you know we're going to make sure that that our cloud or our storage is available to you in order for you to run your business, right? That's a that's the quote unquote promise that they're making. Well, it's not going to surprise you that, well, what that means is, is okay, well, if you do fail, I got to have some type of a backup in place. I'm not an expert on backup systems, but I think reviewing the contract, first of all, is really important. I think the other thing you have to do, Dwayne, is because you know, when I talk about, when I think about connected medical devices, there's a food chain, right? And I spoke about it a little bit earlier. You, you have the tool that assesses the problem. You might have your Apple Watch. You might have some type of a implant. You might have some type of a sensor. Sensors are a big deal these days. Um, um, determining the physiology of someone. Okay, that information gets transmitted. That information gets transmitted again. It goes up into the cloud. It comes down to the clinician. It goes to the clinician's cell phone. And then that clinician is finally getting that information in order to make a determination. What I would tell you, Dwayne, is I think it's important to look at the food chain and then determine at each one of those stages, well, what happens if something goes wrong at those various stages? What could go wrong? Who's going to be upset at you? What are they going to be upset about? And what are the potential damages? Um, so I think it's important to kind of go through that life cycle or food chain to really see where the breaks could occur and then put some type of a mitigation strategy in place. I mean, 
you could always back it up with insurance if something fails and you've got an insurance policy. What I would tell you is that's probably the third or fourth thing that you should think of. Um, I just think it's it's that sentiment. It begins with contracts. It begins with a whiteboard, mapping it out. Look to see where the breaks are going to be, and then ask those important questions with each one of those breaks. Who's going to be responsible, and what happens if it does hit the fan? What kind of contingency do we have in place to make up for whatever I'll call it a breach in that particular case? Does that okay. does that answer the question? It does. Yep. Um, so we got another question from the we got our first question from the audience. Um, what are the risks of saving data with no personal information? of patients in a cloud like AWS. And if we want to save personal info, um, what is the risk? So I'm, I'm gonna make an assumption here that they might be talking about their own data. So I guess there's a couple possibilities, Duane, and work, work through this with me. So we have the first possibility that you have customer data in your possession that you are storing on the cloud that is de-identified, okay? You also may have personal information of your customer that is not de-identified. So on the customer side, but then you also may have, let's say you're a company where you've got your own HR records, right? That, there's a lot of uh, uh, PHI obviously there that you have to store. What I'll tell you is, is that, you know, it, it's in, now we're talking about, if I'm not mistaken, a BAA agreement especially if it's on the customer side, because you've got a business associate agreement, I think that talks about the, those protections and HIPAA and those kinds of things. Um, I, I gotta tell you folks, um, if, if we can't store the information on the cloud, you better have a backup system. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's more effective than to store it on the cloud. So I think you should be in a position to make sure that you have, um, secured your network to the best of your ability, whether you've got PHI on there or not, all of that information assume that it's going to be valuable. And I don't know that it, that it necessarily matters. If you have a claim, if there's PHI involved, it's just different laws that, you're, that are going to affect you. And there's different fines that could be involved and there's different consequences to it. But um, I, would not, I would not let fear drive my business. Right. If, if if you keep personal information, I, I again I wouldn't let fear drive it. I would just find a way to try to secure that information. Um, I, I hope I'm answering the question. I mean, what would you add to that, Dwayne? Is there anything you think you would add, or might that miss the point? No, I think that was good. Um, the question uh, did have some follow up after we asked it there, and it was data and as an example measurements such as numerical arrays from the device of patient with no personal info so that was kind of the the follow-up there well i think that that would be the preferred method mm -hmm. um you know there's a, a new technology out there called federated learning which is um a, a pretty sophisticated way of de-identifying information but allowing multiple um customers to share the, the, the data um, that's inside uh, the, the results uh, without sharing um, uh, identified data of those individuals. Um, so uh, again, don't let fear drive your business. I think um, you know uh, it, it, it gets a little bit complicated when you're behind, or maybe it's better if you're behind someone else's firewall. If you get into a hospital system and you know you know you're protected in that way, that helps. Um, but I don't know. Um, I hope I'm answering the question. You know, maybe the Galen data uh, guys could have a better perspective on that as well. My gut tells me they would. Okay, great. Um, I mean, that's a bit so. Yeah, right. Um, and 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 so, Mike, another question I had was you brought up keeping like you brought up as an example regulatory becoming a W two at some point. Um, Assuming that you know you want to remain pretty lean for um, the duration of your company, right? right. Assuming an exit is in mind, um, what are the risks? Because you also brought up uh, indemnification. Uh, I, I'm just curious. I, I know how these 
contracts work. I know how Project MedTech structures our contracts, right? Yeah, and so uh, there's a lot of indemnification when you use consultants. So, so how do you kind of conceptualize that risk of like from a regulatory quality standpoint, assuming you keep that at a service provider level, right? Right, right. Um, and 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 even with Galen, right, and someone with the cloud, right? How do you how do you kind of identify that risk internally um, at your startup company or small size company? Sure. So um, I think that as far as identifying the risk, I think it really gets down to the first of all, you have to establish the relationship. Is it independent contractor status, or well, more than likely, if it's a third party, it has to be independent contractor status, right? You're never going to have a first party relationship between you and uh, that individual. Um, what I like to do, Dwayne, is um, is make sure that when you're looking at those contracts and agreements and looking at what that service provider is actually very clearly representing to you. In my mind, you know, I can't help myself. I'm always going to go to the what if. Okay, service provider, so you're providing X, but what happens if something does go wrong? What are the remedies? What I would tell you is, is my advice to my customers is this. Not only should you have them commit contractually to indemnifying you, making you whole, having them prove to you that they have the means also to um, respond, but also back it up with an insurance contract. I mean, show me that you have cyber that covers me. Show me that you have, if you're a contract manufacturer of medical devices, I mean, what's your business continuation plan? Dig just a little bit deeper. So what I do, Dwayne, all the time is I try to do the trust but verify. If you're making a representation to me that yes, you will do X, well, there's there's a little bit more that I like to get involved in, some additional questions, and they are, show me your insurance policy. What does your insurance policy say? How many other customers do you have? Do you have a, a, a business continuity plan to try to make sure that you will um, uh, be able to get back up and running? What happens if your if all of my moles are destroyed? What happens if all of my product is destroyed? What are those remedies? How can we understand what those remedies are? And then more importantly, settle the claim before it happens. What is that process going to be in the event of a claim? So it's it's more of a freeform discussion. Um, I, I don't know. It's more. It's probably even outside of, of the uh, the contract itself. You're just getting someone to prove to you that uh, they have the ability to back up what they say they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so we we have about ten minutes left, right? And and so one of the questions I have is, so I guess with 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 risk, right? I mean, it's it's a conversation that uh, you know. It's not like the fun conversation when you have a startup company, right? Where 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 are we gonna go? What's what market are we taking next? Where are we gonna sell this? You know, how are we gonna get to that next level? Those are the fun conversations, um, and, and the risk conversations aren't maybe as fun. Um, a question that maybe you know, I think you did a great job of explaining how to think about risk and and not just going, oh well, this is insurance. It's it's well, okay, wait, how am I? you know, susceptible here, where's my risk here, and, and then how do I address it? Is with insurance, is it not? I, I'm curious on on just your take, it doesn't have to be insurance related or anything like that. If I am a med tech startup company mm -hmm. right now, where are my biggest risks? Like what are the biggest risks facing a med tech startup? It could be very generic. I'm just curious on, sure. on, your, on, your, on your stance on that. Sure, um, I also did, um, a white paper on the life cycle of a medical device and med tech company. If someone is interested, um, right. I can go through that. So the, the life cycle document actually talks about various stages. Um, what are you supposed to be thinking about today? And then anticipate what you should be thinking about as you get to the next milestone. What I'll tell you in the startup phase, Dwayne, um, you don't have to spend a tremendous amount of time um, uh, establishing a risk committee, you know, don't take your time to do that. It's way too early. You're 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 just trying to get a prototype out there. You're trying to get um, uh, this thing launched. You're trying to get some seed money. Contracts, contracts, contracts. 
right? I mean, think about it. Technology transfer agreement, that's a contract. Your lease, contract. Contract manufacturing, contract. And also some type of a term sheet, contract. Those probably four things are the things that are going to that you're going to be facing immediately. So what I would say is be very careful to make sure that you're reviewing all of those contracts or agreements, understand what the terms are, read truth, right? We keep getting back to all this stuff, understand what all the terms are in the contract, and then educate yourself on what those things mean today. And then if you have the time, try to anticipate how they're going to change in the future. I, I just, I don't think you have to spend a tremendous amount of time on it. It's very, very easy to assess pretty quickly uh, at the beginning stage of the company. You don't have, this doesn't have to be very complicated. Okay. And uh, Mike, you wrote a, I think it was a, a, a article in 2021 and it was the 10 things facing a, I think health tech, is that right? Health tech company? Yeah, well, like the top 10 risk. Yeah, yeah. What was this white paper again? Well, um, so there was a blog I did uh, five at a time. Um, so the top 10 risks of uh, a medical device company. And, um, you know, a, a, a lot of them were actually sort of integrated into this um, particular presentation. Um, mm -hmm. the, the human capital piece, finding funding, um, product liability, uh, legal liability. Um, those those were uh, some of the uh, risks that came right. up. So the, the top 10 um, also, Duane, as you and I have talked in the past and even through a podcast that we did um, a few months ago, um, those top 10 might change as the company grows as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think not only will that life cycle white paper help people put things into perspective, but this is, uh, you know, uh, this is a moving target. You, you are going to find that what you thought was important um, to you as a risk at the very beginning stages of the company, you know, maybe it's become a little bit more complicated, but uh, things are going to change. Now your focus as a CEO needs to change as well. Yeah. And, and, and Mike, we didn't have any questions come in. We just had more of a comment of getting a recording of this, right, to share with uh, uh, key stakeholders within a company. So um, just as a reminder to everyone, you, you'll get an emailed copy uh, or an emailed uh, link, and you can go back and send the recording out and that sort of thing. Um, just for the Mike, cyber piece only. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we wrap things up here? Well, I just want to um, thank Galen Data again, and I, I got to put in another plug for their um, their white paper, um, the Definitive Guide to Medical Device Connectivity, and, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, obviously, they're sponsoring this webcast. I'm good business friends with the Galen Data people, but let's be frank, the content of that um, um, white paper is excellent. And I think if you take, I always use my hands, right? Take their white paper and some of the things that I talked about today and you lay them on top of each other, I think you're gonna find a lot of um, similarities and a lot of things that you should be uh, thinking about. But uh, so I can only encourage uh, the crowd to please take advantage of uh, that white paper. The guys at Galen really spent a lot of time on that and uh, I would highly encourage um, you to uh, revisit it. Yeah, Mike, I uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, obviously on the slide here, this is is the the information about Galen data and and the cloud features and benefits. And um, uh, I, I also think you know the webinar series that they've done. Again, this is our twenty first one. It's remarkable. Uh, yeah, I forget when, you know, that I was starting to get involved in these and host these, but um, I look back just at the ones I've hosted and um, they they have just given so much education to the community. And I think that, Absolutely. you know, 
Um, if you're listening and you this is your first one, go back and check out some of the other ones because there's there's a lot of uh, uh, golden and free information uh, for you to consume. But but um, anyways, uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I do mind, Dwayne. Yeah, Galen Data, Galen Data, thank you so much for putting on another uh, solid uh, webinar, and 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 for all the listeners, thanks for for tuning in, sticking with us, and asking questions, and uh, we'll see you next month. Mm-hmm.